Welcome to the Dollar Sprout Podcast, where it's all about building a business that offers consistent income and flexibility so you can live life on your terms. And now, your host, Megan Robinson. Hey there, thanks so much for being here. I'm so excited to launch the podcast with today's episode with Pete McPherson from Do You Even Blog. Pete and I had a great conversation and we covered so many things in this episode, including how Pete went from musician to accountant and what music and accounting have in common, Pete's story of getting laid off from his accounting job and diving headfirst into entrepreneurship, his 40 plus failed business ideas that led him to launch Do You Even Blog, how there's no roadmap or rule book for entrepreneurs to follow, despite what some online marketing gurus or coaches want you to believe, and why that's both liberating and terrifying. (laughs) And Pete also answers the age-old question of which one comes first, an audience or an offer? And so, so, so much more. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed having this conversation with Pete and creating this podcast episode for you. Please welcome Pete McPherson, everybody. All right. Hey, Pete. Thanks for being on the Dollar Sprout podcast, episode number one. You couldn't (laughs) have picked a better person to start. Let me just be frank with you. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I don't think you have any other guests lined up that are as excited to help you <laughs> and Dollar Sprout launch this bad boy. So thank you so much, Megan, that. for having me on the podcast. Yeah, I'm excited about this conversation because I, like you and I met, I think two or three years ago at FinCon, but mm-hmm. I don't know if you know this, I was following you for a while before we met. I've been a member of your online impact community, your membership site. Yeah. I've bought some yeah. of your stuff. You put out yesterday, I think you said, your um, newest product. I forget what it's called, but your template template jam. Template jam. And right. I'm super going to jump on that if it's still open. Oh, nice. It's still open, right? It is, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm super excited. So very glad to have you on the podcast, Pete. Um, so jumping right in here, um, for those of you who aren't do you even blog stands like I am uh, just a little bit of background uh on your business where your business currently is today and then I want to hop into kind of where you came from and and like talk how it got yeah. started I like that style Megan I like that timeline start with where you're at and then let's go back I like that so fast forward to today I run do you even blog as you mentioned I'm coming up on year five of this specific business. And I also have a few other side projects, small businesses, most of which are, are kind of new. I've been dabbling here and there in, uh, in other projects or whatnot. So the bottom line is that it's a lifestyle business, quote unquote, through and through. Meaning I don't have any employees. Hmm. I don't have any bosses. <laughs> I blog, I YouTube, I have my own podcast. I sell digital products. I practice affiliate marketing. I have lots of websites. Like I just dabble in this online business, online entrepreneurship arena. And I'm very fortunate, hashtag blessed, hashtag I'm very blessed (laughs) to be able to do it full time and provide for my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, my secret sauce, which we'll come back to Megan, is that I, I don't always work like 10 to 20 hour weeks, but Most of the time I do like this week, it's, it's currently Wednesday when we're recording this, I've worked uh, like four hours today so far, might put in another one or two and then call it quits. And then the same thing for the past like couple of months, right? Like I I've figured out how to have a business that supports my lifestyle. I have two kids. I like to ski. I just got the first snow a couple of days up here in Northern Michigan. I'm looking forward to ski season. Um, so, so that's where I'm at now, right? The, the yeah. lifestyle business. If you look that up in a dictionary, that's where I'm at. I'm not yeah. a billionaire. I'm, I don't make seven figures a year from this business, but it's more than enough to live comfortably, can be, contribute to retirement and allow me to just do whatever the heck I want with my yeah. time. So I that's think where that's we're at what, now. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what most people 
at least in my experience, people that I've spoken to personally and also um, like our audience with Dollar Sprout, we've done surveys with our email list. And I think that like that's the dream for most people. I don't think most people want to build like multi six figure, seven figure businesses and have yeah. employees. Like the dream is to have a small business that you can kind of work on your own time that supports, yeah, the lifestyle that you want. And so you're living the dream, Pete. But it took a while to get here, right? So wait, okay, take me back. Cause I know before Do You Even Blog, you were an accountant. Is that right? That is correct. So actually. how do you how do you go from being an accountant <laughs> to this like lifestyle yeah. entrepreneur? Yeah. I never knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. Yeah, yeah. I was always super jealous of people who were like, I want to be veterinarians. I want to be a lawyer. I am going into my mother's business. I am X, Y, Z. I was like super jealous of those people ever since I was a young kid, right? And I'll tell you the fun, the first, the fun version of this story, Megan. Mm. So in like fifth, sixth grade, I discovered music. I joined the band program. I played drums mm. and I was actually pretty good at it. And I enjoyed playing and practicing and I got really good at it. And from the, like high school up into like three and a half years of college, I was also a music major in college, the University of Georgia, go dogs. Music was my entire life. I didn't want to do anything else. I was one of those people. I wanted to be a something to do with music, yeah. right? It didn't even matter. Band director, sure. Professional performer, sure. Like music was my jam. I was finally that person I used to be jealous of. Well, my junior year of uh, college, I dropped my music major. I have one of these like six month periods where I was like, oh crap, I don't actually want to do this, but I don't want to be a veterinarian or a lawyer or go into my mother's business or whatever that, you know, is. I had yeah. no idea. I'm back at square one, right? But I was certain that I didn't want to do music mm. as a career anymore. So I quit. All right. So here's where the, the, the story gets fun. I was a business major for a semester. I was an Italian major. Ask me how many words of Italian I can speak. Interesting. I'm going to guess three. Zilch. I don't, I don't think that's Italian. <laughs> None. <laughs> I don't remember a thing. Um, I, I failed almost every class that semester and they kicked me out of school. All right, you're done. Pete, you can't even pass Italian, bro. So I took a semester off. They let me back in and I came back. Uh, There's only one class that I enjoyed during that like year where I'm like failing all my classes and that was sociology. Mm. I bet you can't even define really what sociology is. And to be honest with you, I can't either. But <laughs> I stuck with a sociology degree or curriculum and I got a degree. I got my bachelor's in sociology. Also, you want to take a guess at how old I am and what year this happened here in the United States. I'll just don't bother. I'll spoil it for you. <laughs> right at the awesome depression, 2008, oh, no. 2009, I'm graduating. I've been told all my life from my parents and counselors and friends, all you need is a college degree. You can go get a job. Just get a degree. That's what mm -hmm. they told me when I failed out of school. It's like, Pete, just get a degree and you can get a job. And then 2008 happened and I'm sitting there with a degree of sociology and people are looking at me like, not going to happen. Anyways, mm. so the next version, the next part of this little story is I went to a uh, kind of a lifelong friend slash mentor, friend of my parents who happened to be the dean of the business school at just a little bitty private college in my hometown. I was like, what do I do? His name was Dub. What do I do, Dub? And Dub said, uh, you're into music, right? I was like, yeah. He's like, you should try accounting. <laughs> this is the same thing. And I'm like, I don't get how that works. He's like, I promise you, I think you might actually enjoy it. Try accounting. And in my head, I'm thinking, I like money. Yeah. I don't really know anything about what a business is. I don't know anything about what a lifestyle business is, especially. But I know one thing, and that's I like money. And I'm guessing your listeners do, too. So yeah. I said, sign me up. Let's try out this accounting thing. Well, I did enjoy the accounting classes so much so that I got another degree in accounting. I got my master's degree in accounting. I uh, took a summer off and went on a road trip with my future wife studying for the CPA exam. And I got my CPA exam. And in 2012, I got my first uh, grown-up job. 
right? I could, I could remember exactly where I was holding this offer letter in my hand. I was in the middle of a street in my hometown. No joke. No cars were coming. I was stuck in the middle of a street holding this offer letter, $52,000 a year. Hmm. And I was like, I've made it. This yeah. is it. Yeah. This is the American dream. $52,000 a year. Are you joking? More money than I ever heard of in my entire life. This is ridiculous. I've hit the big time. Well, I took the job and I hated it. <laughs> Spoiler alert. I worked uh, 70, 80 hour weeks um, in corporate accounting, uh, actually public accounting first and then corporate accounting. I did this for like four years, right? And I hated it. I was trying to find a way out. I mean, even from that first year, they kept throwing more money at me. They kept bumping up my salaries. I learned that 52 grand, that's, well, that's right about entry level. And then they kept promoting me, but I hated it. I hated commuting. I hated having bosses, even though I loved the actual people. I love my coworkers and my bosses, but I didn't like reporting to anybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't like spending 50 hours a week with a job and commuting. I hated it, right? Yeah. So during this time, I am starting blogs. I'm starting to figure out online business, not figure out as in like figure out how it works, but I'm starting to discover that there are other ways to make money outside of quote unquote real jobs. So I'm starting blogs. I started a podcast with some friends. It was terrible, by the way. I started a YouTube channel way back in the day, like early 2013, 2014. It was terrible, by the way, just like complete failures all around, but I was having fun and I loved it. I mean, I really loved it. I did personal finance for a hot minute, about a year and a half. I'd had a bluegrass blog. Oh, I don't think I, I had, know about that. I know. Bluegrass. I know. I had, I had lots of different stuff. I had a chalkboard company, e-commerce company. Don't ask me how that went. I got one sale and I lost money. And I said, I'm done. A chalkboard e-commerce company. I tried everything under the sun, right? And nothing was really working. Well, in 2015, 2016, I guess it was late 2016, I about had enough commuting. I'm like sleeping in my car in the morning to try and beat Atlanta traffic and I was crazy stuff. And I found a way out. I found a, a, a part-time job in back in my hometown. I was living in Atlanta. This is back in my hometown. And the part-time job is going to give me salary and benefits. Like, oh, sweet. It's a pay cut coming from like fancy corporate accounting, right? But it was enough. And I still get health insurance and it was yeah, it's great. And it's only part time. It's 20 hours a week. Now I get to like start other side businesses and I, I get to grow a blog and a side hustle. I get to try all that stuff. I have time to do that now. This is the best of both worlds, mm -hmm. right? So it took a hot minute, but I convinced my wife into it. She was teaching lots of uh, music lessons. She is a professional musician, by the way. Um, mm. She stopped teaching her lessons. This is when our second child was on the way. She was pregnant. We sold our house in Atlanta. We moved to Rome, Georgia, which is where I'm from. It's my hometown where the job was and uh, moved into my grandmother's house, which was vacant. She didn't live there. I was just sitting there waiting for us, rent free, mortgage free. And I started this new job and then one paycheck came by and they laid me off. Oh no. Hashtag sad face. Womp womp. <laughs> so, uh, sold our house moved across the state, <laughs> took this new job only to get laid off. Uh, I didn't have any money, by the way. I didn't do anything wrong. I just didn't have any money. Um, I just didn't really know what to do with myself. So we had a couple of options. Number one, I could try to find an accounting job again, which probably meant moving because it was a small town, not a whole lot of accounting jobs. I might could have found something. I know I could have gone back to Atlanta or a bigger city and found a job. I didn't want to do that. My wife didn't really want to do that. So, the other option was to take what emergency fund we had. We also had a little bit more from selling our house and try to make this full-time entrepreneurship thing work. That was uh, December, 2016 through early 2017. And that's when do you even blog was born. Mm -hmm. Five gotcha. years ago. Okay. So. I want to back up for a second because I have mm -hmm. one question that is going to hang in my brain until I ask you, how is it that music and accounting are related? He was correct. And the reason it is, is they're both based on structure and rules. 
And once you learn structure and rules of music, there's only so many notes you can play. And in fact, there's only so many notes you can play at any moment that actually sound good, like far fewer notes that actually sound really good. And chords are nothing but structures of notes and all sorts of stuff. It's based on structure and rules. And once you understand the structure and the rules, it's called music theory, you can compose music. It's going to make you a better player, musician, um, all sorts of stuff like that. It's the same exact thing in accounting. Once you understand the structure of how uh, accounting works, I was going to get super technical. And then I realized like I haven't been an accountant in like five years. And I was like, oh crap, I'm going to get all this wrong because it's been so long. Um, but it's the same thing. It's based on structure and rules. And once you understand that, you everything just starts to make sense, right? It's not actually hard. The hard part is learning the structure and the rules. But after that, you're, you're good to go. So it's actually pretty yeah. similar, believe it or not. That's interesting. Yeah, I never would have made that connection because I always think of music as more of like a creative endeavor. But that does make sense that, you know. Yeah. It is you want to hear something funny? Yeah. Entrepreneurship, this is just my opinion. Some people would completely disagree with me here. Entrepreneurship, in my opinion, is the exact polar opposite. Really? It's about, it's about understanding that there are no rules. Okay. And there isn't really that much structure, right? The people who are rewarded in entrepreneurship are the ones who think outside the box. Or actually, they think about the box before the box is a thing, right? It's all about timing and market. And more importantly, in my opinion, figuring things out, quote, unquote, there was yeah. rarely anything to figure out in music. You learn this or you don't. You practice to improve your muscle memory and your knowledge and that stuff. Accounting, you learn the structure and the rules and you figure out how things fit into that. Entrepreneurship mm -hmm. is like, here are problems that I don't have a rule book to follow. Yeah, I can do Google searches all day and not actually figure out how to grow my business. I can read books and it will actually figure out how to grow my business. I have to try things and get feedback and adapt. It's like the complete opposite of accounting. Yeah. Sorry, that was, a so that was a rant. No, no, you're fine. Um, do you feel like, has that been liberating for you? Has that been like a liberating part of entrepreneurship for you or has that? No, been it's been infuriating. Really? really? No. Yeah. Yep. I, yeah, I agree personally. Like, you're so right. Everybody out there has, you know, a method or a roadmap for like how you can grow your business <laughs> to six figures. But yeah. really, there is no one right way. And there are so many options that it's almost overwhelming. Not yeah. to be a pessimist for anybody listening to this, but yeah, yeah. there is no rule I've, book. I've found that some people, by the way, that b both of us know, we know a lot of the same people, they fit really comfortably in that state of constantly quote unquote, figuring things out, encountering problems that they don't have solutions to. They feel comfortable in that space. I don't, I feel stressed in that space. And I wish that I had a rule book to follow. I think we yeah. all kind of wish that like, I wish you could actually yeah. just tell me what to do and I'll go do it. I still have a lot of that mindset. Some people might even refer to that as like, an employee, employee mindset, mindset yeah. versus an entrepreneur. I still have a lot of that employee mindset built in me. I really do. And that's mm -hmm. part of the reason we can talk about this later, but part of the reason I, th I think I suffer from stress and burnout more than a lot of my peers, not more than everybody, but like some of my peers, I think fall naturally into that. Yeah. I don't know if that made sense or not. Yeah, no, absolutely. It makes sense. I feel like maybe we have similar personality types or something because I feel the same way. Like I don't want to have a boss necessarily, you know, like most people want to be self-sufficient, not answer to anybody. But at the same time, I do really well when I know exactly what I'm supposed to do, you know? So <laughs> yeah, I guess, <laughs> yeah. So as an entrepreneur, what... Has there been a solution that you found or something that has helped you um, like creating systems and structure in your business uh, that's kind of like, yeah, given you that roadmap of what to do? Hmm. Like, I, I don't that, know, for me, external accountability is really helpful. So like masterminds, coaches, that sort of thing. Has there been wow. anything that you found that's really helpful for that side of you? That's interesting. Uh, yes. Before I get to that, though, 
I will also say this. It's funny how, how people are so different. I mean, we get that everybody's different and we get that even people like us who are into the same sort of things, right? Like lifestyle businesses and online businesses, blogging and content and all this stuff. It's funny how we are that different. For me, I do not suffer from, I don't need accountability. I don't huh. need motivating. Yeah. I don't need a coach. Hmm. I, that come, that comes extremely naturally to me. I've never needed that. Um, but for, it's different. I still need things. They're just different. To answer your question, I have kind of figured out something that works for me. And before I tell you what it is, I will also tease that it happens to be the easiest thing in the world for entrepreneurs to lose sight of. I'm gonna say this again, because I actually think it's important. And then I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it is. I think what I'm about to say is the easiest thing for entrepreneurs to lose sight of. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what it is. Be your damn self. We understand oh. this all the time, right? Amen. Just be yourself. Say what you want yeah. to say. Create the business like you want the business to be, how yeah. you think it should be, not based on what your friends are doing, not based on what the Tim Ferriss podcast said, right. not based on what this Robert Kiyosaki book said. Do what you think is best for your customers and for you. Yeah. Say what you want to say on your blog, on your YouTube channel, whatever it is or your email list, whatever it is, be yourself. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So that's super lame, right? And the reason it's super lame is because people have heard it a million times and they lose sight of it. They lose yeah. sight of it. I'm, I'm throwing myself under the bus here. I'm the worst at this. When I look back off here, we, you were telling me about a YouTube video I put out a couple of weeks ago. Um, it didn't blow up or anything. It's only got like a thousand views. But it has like a hundred and you said like 175 comments on YouTube, which is a lot for my channel, right? Like you can go look at other videos with like three comments and like 20 comments, 175 comments. That video was me seriously just being myself. There was no edits. Mm -hmm. It was me walking around in the rain for 30 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever. The, the biggest wins that I've seen in five years of Do You Even Blog, I can trace back to letting Pete be Pete. And I hmm. use those words very intentionally here. And that's because I'll remember that. And I'll be like, Oh my gosh, yes. I need to fall out of the patterns that I just, I'm just doing because everybody else is doing, and I need to do what I want to do. And I need to produce the content I want to produce. And I need to sell the products like I want to sell them. And then a week later it's gone. And I'm back to looking at swipe files. I'm back for looking at roadmaps and frameworks and formulas and downloading PDFs and crap. I lose sight of it so easy. It would boggle your mind. And I have, uh, you can't see it right now. It's on my computer screen. I have a sticky note. It says two things, uh, very important to me. The first one is wise Pete. And you don't know what that means, but let me just give you the 10 second version. That is a constant reminder for me to close my eyes and try and be objective about what I should do for any given scenario, for any given decision. Do I do this product or this product? Do I launch this week or next week? Do I email my list on this topic or this topic? Why am I struggling with this? Why is my audience not growing? Why does my YouTube video flop this week? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? At any given point, I try and do remind myself to be objective and be myself. That's what that mm -hmm. means. So <laughs> that was a really l ranty, long winded answer to your question, but uh, it's the most yeah, corny yeah. advice in the world, but I think it's, I think it's important yeah. to be yourself. Yeah, I, I agree. And I find that so relatable. <laughs> um, I have, you know, a personal financial coaching business, um, and it's not my full-time business, but I love doing it, but I also lose sight of this and I find myself doing, you know, like TikTok videos or Instagram reels where I look back and I'm like, oh, that's so cringy. And it's not cringy because it's corny. It's cringy because that doesn't feel like me at all, you know, <laughs> right. but, but it is so easy to lose sight of and just look at other people online and be like, oh, she's successful or he's successful or they're successful. That's what I need to do to be successful, you yeah. know? Um, and I think also 
being your authentic self, being yourself requires a certain level of self-awareness that, you know, we don't all have (laughs) a very deep level of. Um, So what do you feel like, okay, first of all, what helps you stay in that zone of being authentic? And then I want to hear about, you mentioned you have like the biggest wins that you've seen were when you were being yourself. So can you give some more examples of that? Yeah. Anger is the answer to your okay. question. No, I mean it. Anger. Yeah. So I think uh, part of the reason that content creators and entrepreneurs lose sight of the the truth, which is I, I do need to do things based on first principles. I do need to be myself, quote, unquote, whatever the hell that means, right? Like, so hard to understand. The number one reason people lose sight of it is fear, right? Like, Mm -hmm. if I'm my true self and this flops, well, then I flop, right? Right. If I sell this product, like, I, like, authentically myself or whatever, and it flops, then I authentically flop, right? Like, we tie our Mm -hmm. self-worth to things way more when it is actually us, when we are vulnerable, when we show empathy at the same time, we attach our self-worth to that. Um, or at least I do, I can't speak for everybody, but I definitely do. And so I can put on a face, right? I can follow frameworks. I can follow dollar sprouts guide to being a successful entrepreneur. And if that dollar sprout, I'm just throwing you guys under the bus. If that dollar sprout guide doesn't work, well then it's not Pete. It's Dollar Sprout that sucks, baby. It's not me. Mm -hmm. I don't take the heat. I don't take the responsibility. But when I do things my way and it fails, then I'm a failure. Or at least Mm -hmm. that's the tendency. So that's fear. Um, (laughs) Anger, though. Let's talk about anger. I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a very quick to anger person. I've never yelled like at my wife ever. Uh, I've never yelled really at other human beings. Oh, my kids. That's kind of sad, isn't it? My kids might actually be the only people I've ever yelled at. Um, I'm not like a, it's relatable for every parent. I'm I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, (laughs) I'm not like a quick to anger person. I'm a very slow to anger person. So when I finally erupt, first of all, it's always at myself. I'm always like, I'm so fed up with making excuses or I don't even know off the top of my head, but I, I get angry at myself. And whenever that happens, it happens like maybe once every three to six months at this point in my career, I think, man. I usually do really well when I'm fired up and angry at myself and I'm like, I'm tired of making excuses. I'm tired of being afraid. I'm tired of being afraid of failing and not even that, but I'm tired of being perceived as a failure from my audience and from my peers and all that stuff. I get angry and I push through that and then I'm myself and I make YouTube videos that end up doing better. I write blog posts that end up doing better. I write sales copy that ends up earning more dollars. Quite literally, you're, you're asking about examples. One of my biggest examples of this was relaunching Online Impact after shutting it down for an entire year. Like I had a product that made forty-two dollars or $43,000 in my first year blogging just to this product. And after that year, I shut it down. I killed it. I stopped. And we can talk about why later. It's not important. The important part is a year later, I was so angry at myself. I was like, I'm doing this. I'm just doing it. Like I, I got to chalk this up to failure. I'm going to relaunch this thing. I'm going to rebrand it online impact. It's my membership community still going. And that was like, I'm not gonna say it was like the best month financially. Cause I've certainly made more money since then, but in terms of like joy and happiness and entrepreneurship, that was my top month when I relaunched online impact it was October, 2019, I believe. I think so. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned, I think that that's absolutely true, you know, that people aren't themselves often online or in their businesses because we do fear failure and we fear like, oh, if I put myself out there and this fails, that means something about me. That means, you know, like you said, I'm a failure or people don't like me or I'm a terrible person. I don't know. Whatever it is that's going on in our minds, we tie so much meaning to our work, meaning about ourselves. What have you been able to figure out 
a way to not do that, to not tie your self work self worth with your work and your success in your business. No. <laughs> If you ever find a podcast guest <laughs> that has that one figured out, uh, point them in my direction because I need to listen to that. Yeah. No, I don't think so. But you know what? Can I talk on this for a minute? I'm gonna, yeah, yeah. I'm going to rant. We were talking about entrepreneurship in general. And I, I mentioned, quote, unquote, figuring things out. Like that's the job mm -hmm. of an entrepreneur is to figure things out, solve difficult problems, yeah. right? Um, one thing I've gotten better at. So no, uh, self imposter syndrome, tying my self worth worth to my work. No, I still struggle from this like every day, hardcore. Um, I don't know if everybody does, but I certainly do. But there's one thing I've gotten better at over the past five years, and that is understanding that that's just part of the job, right? When you talk about accounting or when you talk about being a music teacher, or a lawyer or working at Burger King. I don't care. All of these jobs have expectations. And I don't mean expectations from a boss, but an expectation on what your life will be like. If you don't want to work 60 hours a week, don't become a lawyer. If you don't want to be around animals, don't, don't become a vet. That sounds pretty smart. If you don't like having a 100% completed to-do list and no stress and anxiety, don't become an entrepreneur. Don't do it because right. that is the job. And like I said, some people naturally work with the stress and in chaos and anxiety of figuring things out uh, more than others. The self-worth thing, the imposter syndrome, that's part of the job. As a content creator and entrepreneur, that's the expectation that your life is now. You will never grow out of it fully. Some people have it worse than others, but not a day ago. So I run my own podcast and I've had, I've had billionaires on literally the person who mm -hmm. created WordPress. I've had the number one marketer in the world on Seth Godin. I've had Rosemary Groner on, who's a personal friend of mine who just crushes it in her business and have for a year. I've had hundreds of people on here who are making millions and billions of dollars and every single one of them has issues like this. It's part of the job. It's not something yeah. I think we can figure out and then it's gone. It's not a problem to mm -hmm. be solved. It's a problem to be managed. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Somewhere around like 2019 ish, like late 2019, where I, I began to get more comfortable with, mm -hmm. um, I was gonna say business depression, like suffering, like every couple of months, I still go through this to this day, um, just kind of thinking like, is this actually working? Like, am I doing a good enough job? Should I go get a real full-time job? Should I quit? Like, I, I'm just not sure. Like I'm making money, but is this enough money? Like, should I be doing something different? I'm not sure if I'm making right, wise decisions, all this stuff. It took me a couple of years, but at this point I have come to manage it better. I, I use the word manage. I think that's actually a good analogy. Now that I think about it this uh business depression imposter syndrome never ever having a complete to-do list ever not once i've become more comfortable in a day-to-day -day life and you can ask my wife i'm pretty sure she would agree with you there for the first couple of years i was not comfortable with it i thought i was doing something wrong i thought i was a mm -hmm. terrible entrepreneur i thought it was all me i'm not doing something right and it took me that long to figure out like it's not that it's that this is part of the job of an entrepreneur or content creator, which is what I consider myself with an entrepreneur. Um, yeah. And so the takeaway there is I think it gets easier, not easy, not solved, but I think some of these issues that we've been talking about, I, I truly believe they do get easier with time and experience. There you go. There's my motivational, uh, positive uptick. Yeah. 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 No, that makes sense. Um, so you feel like you've been able to accept a little bit the discomfort and the uncertainty and the feeling like maybe you're doing it wrong or, you know, yeah. um, the imposter syndrome and all the feelings that are that you've just come to accept that that's part of the territory. And You just said that more eloquently than I, uh, I ever did in the past half hour. So that was it right there. Good job. <laughs> okay. Yes. Well, 
Yeah, I I really appreciate you sharing that because that makes me, you know, selfishly feel a little better because these are, yeah, all things that I have also felt in my own business. And, you know, the um, comparison of like looking at other people and thinking they look like they have it so figured out. I know. But really, yeah, you're right. Nobody does. Even people who very much look like they do. Yeah. I think that's and who are by, yeah, all definitions successful, don't necessarily have it figured out. Yeah, totally. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about, uh, kind of backing up to before. Do you even blog? Um, you have a really great blog post that I love that I read years ago and I reread before this interview because I just love it so much and I think it's so important. It is called My Failure Resume, and it is 40-plus failed blogs and projects that led you to start the business that you have today. Um, so can can you talk about what are some of your favorite failed projects that you had, um, and what lessons did you learn from them? Yeah. Uh, so you'll notice if... I don't suggest anybody rewind and go back. But if you did, when I was telling my origin story a little while ago, you'll notice that I completely skipped past this uh, this getting let off from the startup job and then starting Do You Even Blog. Like there was, that's all I said, right? I didn't, I didn't fill in that gap yeah. whatsoever. And allow me to do that now because that hints at this question. <laughs> I tried a lot of things as that failure resume will showcase, I started my first blog in 2009. I started my first podcast, uh, or actually it was a friend of mine's podcast that I did all the tech work for in 2009, 2010. It was terrible. Uh, I, I, the chalkboard company, like all those different things. In my eyes today, those were all failures, but not failures as in like regret, we regret it. Like, you know what I mean? Like we all realize that failure can teach us important lessons and give us valuable information about ourselves. And I just kind of clump all them together at this point, just because it was a, a long time ago. But there was one thing that all of those failed blogs and online businesses had in common. And this is, this is my, uh, this, this was my ultimate failure for like eight years. They were not what I wanted to do. And I knew setting up my very first website in 2009, I don't know if you could really call it setting up a website because it was literally just blogspot.com at that point. I think it was blogspot. Maybe it became blogger. Doesn't matter. The point is I knew right then and there that I liked the behind the scenes stuff way more than anything else I was blogging about. Uh, we talked about the bluegrass blog. I love listening to bluegrass. I play bluegrass music. I didn't enjoy blogging about it, not once. I don't really know why I started that site. I Well, I know exactly why I started the site. I like started the site because I liked blogging. I liked websites. I liked creating content for people. I like that stuff. I didn't care about bluegrass. I started a personal finance site. I don't actually really care about personal finance. I mean, I'm into it because I like money, but I don't really, really want to talk about it. I don't want to start another personal finance blog or podcast or YouTube channel. I just don't care. I like the behind the scenes stuff. I like the meta stuff. I like talking about blogging and podcasting and marketing. Like that's why I started to even blog. There it is right there. Mm. I would not let myself do that for, we'll see, uh, seven, seven or eight years. From the time I started, uh, there was 50 plus blogs that failed, online businesses, the <laughs> chalkboard e-commerce company, all that stuff, right? I was not letting myself do what I wanted to do. And this is also a little corny and woo woo. People are just going to have to forgive me for that. But the, the reason I gave myself was there's already, there's already the Pat Flynn's and Amy Porterfield's and uh, I don't know, Gary V or Tim Ferriss or all these people who are talking about blogging and online business and entrepreneurship and so forth. What do I have to add to that? And my, my answer to myself was nothing like what good am I? Pat Flynn already has the podcast. I mean, on lockdown, man, like they don't need to do even blog podcasts. And so, I mean, even before that was a thing, right? Like I told myself that space is saturated. 
I don't need to do that. There's enough people talking about this already. I was right, by the way, but I shouldn't have let that stop me. And so we we're talking about anger can do really profound and glorious things for me. When I got laid off, I was angry. And I finally allowed myself to do what I wanted to do, which was talk about blogging. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's time before I was going to tell you how that came to be, but it really doesn't even matter. It was, it was interviewing people via Skype, personal mm -hmm. finance bloggers specifically, because that was my friends at the time that kind of, uh, got me to that point. But that was like, that was like my overarching failure with all these blogs and businesses. And when I finally like sat down and gave myself permission to do what ended up becoming, do you even blog? Good God. I like, I loved it. And it made a difference. It resonated with people. People found it somehow and shared it like right from the get go. I mean, it didn't like take off or anything, but it was like, this felt different. And the reason it felt different is because mm -hmm. it's actually what I wanted to do. Again, I know that's a little corny, but that's the truth. Yeah. So I'm curious. I feel like I have such a hard time when I work on something and I put my soul and my energy and so much time and effort into it. I have a really hard time personally letting go of it and accepting that it's just a failure. So how do you know when to accept that something's just not working out and accept it as a failure? I have no idea. So uh, for anybody listening to this, who's just be like, wow, this has been the most useless podcast interview ever because Pete knows nothing. I will point you, my friends, to a great book by Seth Godin called The Dip. And it's been a while back, actually, since I've listened to it now. I should probably go re-listen to it. I have it on, on Audible. Uh, it's, it's about the subject. It's about knowing when to quit. And how quitting is actually a superpower. And I, I, I'm with him on this. Um, but to be really frank with you, Megan, like I have no idea. Uh, you know what? I thought of a better answer. Uh, half of this is Pete being Pete. And half of this is like advice that other people have given that I'm just regurgitating. I'm being 100% honest with you. A lot of people, when they're wondering like, hey, what should I start a blog on? Like, I'd love to do like a freelance side hustle start my own business. I just don't know what to do. A lot of common advice given is to go ahead and start something in an area or a topic or an industry or a niche or whatever, that even if you don't make money for like three years, you will be able to persist with, right? Like if you're starting a blog, choose a topic that you can blog for three years about, not make a dime mm -hmm. and still be really happy with. Right? People say this all the time. I actually think that's really good advice. And it's not an answer to your question of like, how do you how do you figure out when you should quit something? Or, you know, what's working and what's not. But I will say that the only reason I didn't quit doing even blog a year ago, two years ago, and three years ago was because I actually enjoy it. I enjoy what I do. And if that wasn't the case, I would have quit a long ass time ago. I really would have. Yeah, I think, you know, they say when you're starting a business or whatever, do like choose something that you would do for free. And that sounds kind of like what you're saying is just do something that you know you're going to be able to enjoy or persist with. And that might change over time, right? Like you may think you could enjoy something for three years and you get six months in and it's like yeah. the most miserable thing. And then maybe you look at like, well, is it the content medium? Do I just hate writing? Do I prefer speaking? I feel like that's kind of what has happened with me personally and my uh, financial coaching business is I start, it started as a personal finance blog and I realized over time, I hate writing so much. Yeah. I just want to like sit and talk to people. I just want to do this and have a conversation, you know, or like, I talk to myself all the time throughout the day anyway. So podcasting made more sense. It felt more natural, you know, but like, yeah, I think for me digging in and, and asking, trying to ask myself more specific questions about like, what is it that's not working exactly? Yeah. Is it that I feel inauthentic the way that I'm marketing this? Is it that I hate the process or how, like 
the medium where I'm producing content or do I just hate the subject yeah. area? And again, I think that for me it required a lot of self-awareness and kind of digging into, like you said earlier, what is it that I enjoy? Yeah. So I, uh, <clears throat> I'll share this with you too. The whole, yeah. uh, follow your passion, do what you're passionate about, or even what we just said, which was try and find things that you can persist with, even if you don't make money. I feel like that advice, follow your passion. Let's just call it that, right? That is simultaneously the best advice anybody could ever give you and the worst advice anybody could ever give you. And that's because that is one piece in a jigsaw puzzle. I have this really good mm. blog post. I'm a self promo at this point. Um, I didn't come up with yeah. it, which is the only reason it's good. Uh, my friend Chelsea, she gave me this. Um, here we go with the frameworks again. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I call it a framework too in my blog post. Oh crap. Here we go. Uh, I think, I think I call it like the crisscross drill. Uh, or the crisscross framework or something. The point is to take a few of these questions, what are you passionate about? And combine them with other questions, which is, what am I good at? That's another one right there, because those things can be different. What am I passionate about? What am mm -hmm. I good at? What can actually make money? Like what has the potential to make money? I could do lots of businesses that I'm passionate about, Megan, and they would be terrible. And they would never make any money because I'm passionate about a lot of stuff that doesn't make money. So I think the important yeah. part is to ask a few of these questions to help you find an idea or find a product or find the content channel that you, you really enjoy doing and can make money and you're good at it, right? It takes a little bit of trial and error, but I think if we combine the follow your passion advice with some of these more practical questions, I think that could help a lot of people. I think that could save a lot of people a lot of time and headache, right? Yeah. And I think I know the blog post that you're referring to. We'll definitely link to it in the show notes for this episode for people who want to go take a look at that. I know we're like three minutes from our time. Um, do you mind if I ask you a few like slow round questions? <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, so absolutely. my my favorite comedian ever, Mike Birbiglia, do you know who he is? I do. I don't know his work super well, but I've definitely seen some of the stuff. He's so good. He's so good, Pete. Um, he has like four, three or four specials on Netflix. My favorite one ever is uh, My Girlfriend's Boyfriend. Highly, highly recommend. But the reason I brought him up um, is because he has a podcast called working it out. And, um, instead of like a lightning round or rapid fire questions, he does a slow round. And, uh, I really like that idea more than like, you know, quickly, what's your first answer? Um, so I'm going to ask you a few slow round questions then. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Um, so first off for somebody who is just getting started or maybe toying with the idea of starting a lifestyle business or an online business, what are some really practical pieces of advice you would give to them other than maybe what we've talked about in the show so far? <laughs> <clears throat> Let's see here. Slow round version, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, I like that. It gives me a second more to think. So I have yeah. a two pronged approach. And this is like a, uh, oh, screw it. Let's just call it a framework. Here's my two-step framework for those people. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding now. Um, another piece of advice that is simultaneously amazing and terrible is to just do it. Just start, right? We hear this all the time. Just start. Like you're interested in starting a lifestyle business? Just start something, man, today. Get something out there. Girl, boss babe. This week, hustle, do it, launch it, get it out, just start, just do it. Simultaneously amazing and terrible advice. I think it needs to be paired with a second item. And my second item would be this. Uh, do those things, start today, try something today, make a phone call and try to make a sale on a product that doesn't even exist yet today. Do all those things, but keep an active eye out for what's working. I'm going to say this mm -hmm. one more time because this is my, this is my answer to your question. I think you should try and start a business next week, right? I think you should launch that blog 
today. You'll figure out the tech stuff. You'll figure out like, what is copywriting and who cares? Like, why do I need to know this? Right. Um, what is an email list? Like, how do I do email marketing? How, do I actually need social accounts and TikTok? Like all the crazy stuff that you have no idea how to do yet. You need to get past this barrier of learning all that stuff. And the only way to get there is to publish a hundred blog posts, to make 20 sales calls, to fail at 50 plus online blogs and businesses and chalkboard e-commerce companies. But, but that's a very important, but keep an eye out for what is working. If you have to fail at something, fail at something. If you have to move quickly, please do, but try and keep a very active eye on what's working and what's not, because that I think is the fastest way to get to a successful lifestyle business. You're going to have to try. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to do a lot. You're going to have to write a lot to understand that you hate writing. You're going to have to try yeah. and launch a podcast only to discover this sucks. You're going to have to do a lot of that stuff, but it's all going to be wasted time if you can't look back at the end of every single day, week, month, and year and ask yourself, like, what did I enjoy? What was I good at? What made money? What did I enjoy? What was I good at? And what made money? And how can I lean into that more? Now I can focus and double down and turn what was a failure or a mediocre success into something that actually rolls downhill, that actually starts to grow and gains traction faster and faster. So there's my slow yeah. answer to your question. Yeah, thank you. I, that was a great answer. Um, kind of going off that, uh, I don't know what it was that you said exactly that reminded me of this topic, um, but what do you think comes first? Uh, so a lot of people get into... I want to start an online business. And they're like, well, I need an audience first. So they don't even think about how they're going to make money in their business, right? They they go on social media and they start posting videos and content and working really hard on that to gain an audience and then eventually, you know, figure out what they're going to sell. So do you think, like, which comes first, audience building or having a product to sell? Hmm. So this answer changed from five years ago, especially like 10 years ago, right? In the 2000, mm -hmm. early 2000s, 2010s, even up to like 2014, 2015, 2016, this answer is completely flip-flopped. So if you had asked me that question back in 2015, 2016, even though I have no idea what I was doing back then, I would have told you, you need an audience and you should do everything in your power to get an audience with an audience who knows you and likes you and trusts you and respects you and follows you, you can do damn near anything you want. You want to reach the moon for the seven figure business. You could probably figure out a way to do it. You just do a little lifestyle business. You could probably do it. Now I'm going to, uh, this is the first podcast for the dollar Sprout podcast episode. So I, I'm, I'm excited to get to go out with this. I'm going to kill my career right here. <laughs> audiences, audiences are overrated. Mm. Sorry. Followers of Do You Even Blog? I really say, Megan, how many of my emails have you opened in the past year? Every one of them? I mean, I personally open a lot of your emails, but... Oh, crap. Well, this is a terrible You're example. talking to okay. the wrong person for that <laughs> The point is, uh, Megan's like a super loyal Pete Super fan, apparently. <laughs> no. Uh, the point is, audiences are overrated. I spent a long time. I've gained over 15, 17,000 email subscribers over the past five years. I've whittled them down to 6,000. Over and over again, I have to wean people because they don't open any of my emails. Right now, I've been emailing people this week for a brand new product. My open rates are like 20%, 25%. I think I got one that was like 27%. One quarter of the people don't open any of my emails, like almost ever, right? It's rare that I get above this. And I have a social following that I really don't really see any benefits from anymore. I get traffic. I have, uh, I don't know where my YouTube views are are at right now, but it's several thousand. It's, it's like 20,000, 25,000 views a month on YouTube. I don't get a whole lot out of that. I don't get a whole lot out of my email subscribers. If I'm being honest, I remember people launching things in 2010 with like 1000 people email list with their open rates are like 60, 70, 80% and just making like $30,000 in like this little late launch. I'm sure that's still possible today. I'm sure it is. I'm sure people will do it. There's going to be somebody out there that disagrees with me. I think it's harder than ever before. Yeah. There's one thing that doesn't go out of style. Learning how to sell things. 
my friend Liz Wilcox. I'll give her some praise. I'll give her some credit where credit is due. Liz uh, sold a blog that she had done for several years in a travel space. I started over, started from scratch. And she didn't go out there and start a blog. Uh, she's talking about email marketing. Like that's kind of her jam. She's kind of, she's like an email marketer. She loves email marketing. She didn't go out there and start a blog. She didn't start a podcast. She didn't start a YouTube channel. She didn't produce any content of any kind. All she did was try and go get freelance clients. I should go start off with freelancing. Okay, cool. Now she has an audience of several thousand people that buy her courses in digital products. It's less than two years later. The point is she started with a service. Now you don't have to freelance per se. You can do this with a product too. But she got on the phone with people. She emailed people. She hustled in the real sense of the word. Not forever. She doesn't hustle now. She sits on the beach for 20 hours a week. <laughs> she did to start with to build up a resume, to build up a portfolio, to make them enough money to be able to do this longer, right? It's the opposite approach. She didn't start with the audience. The audience came naturally. Now that she knows what the hell she's talking about. And so for anybody listening to this, I'm sorry. Megan's really good at getting me to rant. I would say this, starting a blog, starting a podcast, getting on TikTok. If you're not already on TikTok, starting up that Twitter account. I'm not even on Twitter. Doing all these things to build an audience, quote unquote. Not the be all end all advice. I'm not saying it's wrong. I think there are incredible benefits from blogging and, and YouTube and podcasting. I, I, they're incredible benefits. It's my job. Of course I think this. I love this stuff. But no, you don't need an audience to make money. You don't need an audience to make a full-time gig at all, right? And I think that's both good news and bad news. The bad news is, well, okay, now I got to figure things out. I got to figure something else out. I got to figure out how to make money in a different way. But the good news is uh, there's freedom there, right? You really do get to do what you want to do. You don't want to write like Megan. You don't have to. You don't have to blog. You don't have to YouTube. You don't have to podcast. You don't have to send a bunch of emails and cold call people to do freelance work. You can kind of do what you want. That's the good news. And the bad news is, well, you still have to figure it out, quote unquote. Yeah. You still have <laughs> to figure out what you're going to sell, whether yeah. it's a product or a service. Yeah. 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 No, I completely agree. And I think that my mindset on that has also changed over the last few years because um, you hear about more and more people, especially on social media, but even with, you know, giant email lists who, um, have an audience, but their audience doesn't buy. And, uh, I agree that I think if you have something to sell first and you're kind of testing it and putting it out there and focusing on, you know, what transformation you can give people through that product or service. Um, yeah, I think that the audience can come later. And some people will say that you do it like you can do it at the same time, you yeah. know, build an audience while you're figuring out what you're selling. And I mean, as you mentioned earlier, Pete, there is not necessarily a right answer, um, but I do, I do tend <laughs> right. to agree with you. There is no one roadmap for entrepreneurship, but yeah, I, I agree. I think that first you have to figure out how you're going to make money because that's, that's the reason you're starting a business. I mean, you're starting a business maybe to help people also very important, but you can't stay in business unless you make money and yeah. to make money. You have to sell something. Yeah. I, uh, I actually, while you were talking just then I pulled open my, uh, like software here where I track my sales. Cause I was just curious. I I've made, uh, I don't mind sharing. I've made $245 today. Yesterday I made, uh, 1300. And, uh, the reason is it's because I sold stuff. I sent emails yeah. with a product and links for people to buy. And I don't, don't, don't do that every single day. I do have some sources of passive income, which we can talk about in part two of this podcast episode whenever I come back. But yeah. the point is you got to put yourself out there. You got to find a product. You got to try different products or services or whatever that is. And you gotta, yeah, you have to sell it. You gotta find something to sell. Yeah. And you got to sell it. Yeah. That's the only way to make money, period. Yeah. Last slow round question I have for you and then so we'll wrap randy. up and I'll let you go. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, what is a common myth or misconception about running an online business or a lifestyle business that you want to clear up once and for all? Or you can name multiple myths, but at least one if you have one. 
so many. Oh my gosh. So many. <laughs> um, well, I think the biggest two people already know, but they don't believe. And that is, it'll be easy or quick, right? If, a, if you were to stop a random person on the street who wants to start a business and be like, do you think it'll be easy? They're like, oh, no, 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 I know. It's, it's going to be a long road. Uh, ahead, right? Do you think it's going to be quick? Nah, no, I'm fully prepared. I, I know it's not going to be an overnight success. But yet here we are starting things and then falling back into the traps of like, why is it this working? Why am I not good enough? Am I good enough? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And it's because we let these expectations uh, come back to us, right? That, and then we follow people on Instagram and be like, oh, crap, like, Megan Dollar Sprout made $137,000 last month. What, what am I doing wrong with my business? Right? It's not fast. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. Yeah. And I think people should tattoo that on their, uh, I feel like the popular place to tattoo it would be like on your, your forearm, maybe, you know, so it's not super publicly visible, but put it right there. Like this is not easy and it's not fast and it never will be. And as long as you can be yeah. comfortable with that, go forward. Right. So. Yeah. That's my myth. Nice. Well, Pete, where can people find out more about you? I know that you said you're launching Online Impact the Monday after we are um, recording this, yeah. but unfortunately, this probably isn't going to air until January of 2022. So can it's people okay. still get into Online Impact? Okay, cool. Yeah, it's evergreen. People can join any time of year. So uh, here's, here's my self promo. I'll point anybody who's interested in any of this stuff, probably to my YouTube channel, but I won't give you that URL because who knows what that is. Actually, I do. It's youtube.com slash do even blog. But I'll just point you to my homepage, do even blog.com. That's where you can find everything to do with Pete. If you want to reach out through email uh, or Twitter, I, uh, I look at all that stuff that anybody sends me. You're welcome to do that. Follow the YouTube channel. That's mostly where I produce content these days. All that impact is our private community, uh, which is not. For beginners, it's not. I don't want anybody to pay me for that right now. Because if you're a beginner and you, you don't have anything, you don't have a platform, you don't have an audience, and you don't have a product, uh, you, you don't need to pay me for that yet. So just go follow my YouTube channel, my free stuff. If you are a current contentpreneur, content creator, entrepreneur, and uh, and you're looking for community, mastermind groups, group coaching, uh, we do quarterly workshops where I, I bring people in to teach different things like our last one was on sales page copywriting. And I had a friend of mine come in and uh, lead a workshop on that. We do that like a couple of times a year. If you're into that, um, it's $9 a month, but there is a, an entry fee. There's $1,000 to join. And I have payment plans for that as well. You can learn all about that stuff and more at doyouandblog.com. And specifically, nice. doyouandblog.com slash OI, as in just the two letters, doyouandblog.com slash OI. Nice. Do you have anything currently, any resources, um, any like blog posts or YouTube videos that are more geared toward beginners? A ton. And in fact, that I believe is what my website and podcast accomplish. In the first okay. couple of years to do even blog, I was focused on the podcast. That was my main thing. Yeah. And almost every single guest I had were geared towards um, not necessarily all geared towards beginners, but a lot of it was. And so what I would tell people to do, and I still get emails to this day. I'm very proud of this. I get emails to this day. It'll be like, Hey, your recent podcast episodes are kind of like hit or miss, but I went back through your archives and they're just blowing me away. I'm like, well, th thanks for the backhanded compliment. But for anybody beginning, I would say go to <laughs> doyouvlog.com and look at the podcast because the first three years of that are chef's kiss Mwah! towards beginning mm -hmm. online entrepreneurs. I really do believe that. Nice. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much for being here, Pete. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, yeah. And we'll have to bring you back for a part two if you're up for it. What do you think? <laughs> I'm always down. <laughs> Just let me know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much right, for having cool. me. This has been a lot of fun. Hey there, it's Megan from the Beyond post interview with Pete. Personally, I think Pete really delivered in that interview. He had a lot of great things to say, and I appreciate all the wisdom that he shared from his experience in business over the years. Listening back through the recording, I took a ton of notes, 
So I'm going to share with you my key takeaways and reflections from our conversation. Key takeaway number one, look for the common denominator in the things you enjoy. Pete gave the example of a professor, I think it was a professor, who told him that because he liked music, he might also enjoy accounting. That sounded absurd to me when Pete first said it, but his explanation made a lot of sense. I went to a uh, kind of a lifelong friend slash mentor, friend of my parents, who happened to be the dean of the business school at just a little bitty private college in my hometown. I was like, what do I do? His name was Dub. What do I do, Dub? And Dub said, uh, you're into music, right? He's like, yeah. He's like, you should try accounting. <laughs> this is the same thing. And I'm like, I don't get how that works. He's like, I promise you, I think you might actually enjoy it. Try accounting. He was correct. And the reason it is, is they're both based on structure and rules. And once uh-huh. you learn structure and rules of music, there's only so many notes you can play. And in fact, there's only so many notes you can play at any moment that actually sound good, like far fewer notes that actually sound really good. And chords are nothing but structures of notes and all sorts of stuff. It's based on structure and rules. And once you understand the structure and the rules, it's called music theory, you can compose music. It's going to make you a better player, musician, um, all sorts of stuff like that. It's the same exact thing in accounting. Once you understand the structure of how uh, accounting works, everything just starts to make sense. Understanding not just what you like, but also why you like it can help you identify commonalities among seemingly unrelated things, whether that's a potential business model or a career path or a new product or service. Pete realized that part of what he enjoyed about music was the structure of it the rules, the patterns, the formulas, and in that way, accounting is very similar. If you're looking for your next or your first business idea, your product or your service or whatever, make a list of the things that you enjoy and what specifically you like about them. Then find the common denominators. You might be surprised at what opportunities pop up. Key takeaway number two, If you're looking for the perfect business framework or roadmap to follow, I'm sorry to tell you this, but it doesn't exist because in entrepreneurship, there really are no rules. Entrepreneurship, in my opinion, is the exact polar opposite. Really? It's about, it's about understanding that there are no rules and there isn't really that much structure, right? The people who are rewarded in entrepreneurship are the ones who think, outside the box, or actually they think about the box before the box is a thing, right? It's all about timing and market. And more importantly, in my opinion, figuring things out, quote, unquote, there was rarely anything to figure out in music. You learn this or you don't, you practice to improve your muscle memory and your knowledge and that stuff. Accounting, you learn the structure and the rules and you figure out how things fit into that. Entrepreneurship is like, here are problems that I don't have a rule book to follow. Yeah. I can do Google searches all day and not actually figure out how to grow my business. I can read books and I will actually figure out how to grow my business. I have to try things and get feedback and adapt. It's like the complete opposite of accounting. This realization can be both liberating and also a little terrifying. (laughs) Those who thrive as entrepreneurs are often the ones who are more comfortable or who learn to be comfortable with the unknown, with uncertainty. They're the ones who understand that there's no one right way to run a business and therefore they can build and design a business that fits their lifestyle, their personality, and their goals. Of course, in order to do that, you need to know what your goals and your personality and your ideal lifestyle are which involves a bit of self-awareness and reflection and also the ability to listen to and trust yourself to make the decisions that are right for you. If you're not there right now, then don't worry. This is an ongoing process. And like many other aspects of entrepreneurship, it's a skill that comes with practice. 
practicing listening to your gut and making small decisions every day that align with the business that you want. Not the business that someone else has, not the business that coaches on Instagram say you should build, but the business that you actually want. Key takeaway number three, be yourself. I think what I'm about to say is the easiest thing for entrepreneurs to lose sight of. Now, here's what it is. Be your damn self. We understand this all the time, right? Amen. Just be yourself. Say what you want to say. Create the business like you want the business to be, how you think it should be, not based on what your friends are doing, not based on what the Tim Ferriss podcast said, not based on what this Robert Kiyosaki book said. Do what you think is best for your customers and for you. Say what you want to say on your blog, on your YouTube channel, whatever it is, or your email list, whatever it is, be yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. So that's super lame, right? And the reason it's super lame is because people have heard it a million times and they lose sight of it. It's so true. And as Pete mentioned, it's so easy to lose sight of, especially when you see other people on social media, seemingly living your dream. But One of the most important things I think to keep in mind is to be yourself, to know yourself and to, you know, market your business and create products and services that align with you and that fit the business that you want to have. And this applies if you are the face of your business, like if you have a blog or a coaching business or whatever, and you're the face of your company, but it also applies if you're not the face of your business, because It matters that you're staying true to who you are. And if you're not, if you're just doing what you think is going to make you successful, then you could very well end up building a business that is miserable for you to run and that you don't enjoy doing at all. And that is not the point of having a lifestyle business. Key takeaway number four, don't follow your passion Find the intersection between what people need, what you're good at, and what you enjoy doing. I have this really good Mm. blog post. I'm a self-promo at this point. Um, I didn't come up with it, which is the only reason it's good. Uh, My friend Chelsea, she gave me this, uh, I think I I call it like the crisscross drill uh, or the crisscross framework or something. The point is to take a few of these questions, what are you passionate about? And combine them with other questions, which is, what am I good at? That's another one right there, because those things can be different. What am I passionate about? What am Mm. I good at? What can actually make money? Like, what has the potential to make money? I could do lots of businesses that I'm passionate about, Megan, and they would be terrible. And they would never make any money, because I'm passionate about a lot of stuff that doesn't make money. So I think the important part is to ask a few of these questions to help you find an idea or find a product or find the content channel that you, you really enjoy doing and can make money and you're good at it, right? It takes a little bit of trial and error, but I think if we combine the follow your passion advice with some of these more practical questions, I think that could help a lot of people. I think that could save a lot of people a lot of time and headache, right? I looked up the blog post that Pete mentioned on his website after our call so I could tell you more about it. And the blog post, which is linked in the show notes for this episode, talks about how to use this exercise to find ideas for digital products. But you can also use it to brainstorm business models and content ideas and et cetera, et cetera. The way this exercise works is you ask yourself five questions. Number one is, what does your audience need help with? Number two, what helps them do those things? What products or services, what do they need to do those things? What are you good at? What do you enjoy doing? And then where's the crossover in all of that? And that crossover is the business, the content, the product, or the service that you should focus on. Again, the link to Pete's blog post is in the show notes. You'll also find in that blog post of his um, an example of how Pete used this exercise in his business, and you'll find the podcast episode that Pete recorded with Chelsea Brennan of Smart Money Mamas 
on how she used this exercise to come up with this product idea that has since made her business hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue. I think that this is actually maybe Chelsea's original exercise. Um, Anyway, highly recommend giving that podcast episode a listen. Key takeaway number five, find your product or service first, then build an audience around that product or service. Audiences are overrated. I spent a long time. I've gained over 15, 17,000 email subscribers over the past five years. I've whittled them down to 6,000 over and over again. My friend, Liz Wilcox, I'll give her some praise. I'll give her some credit where credit is due. Liz uh, sold a blog that she had done for several years in a travel space. I started over, started from scratch and she didn't go out there and start a blog. Uh, she's talking about email marketing. Like that's kind of her jam. She's kind of, she's like an email marketer. She loves email marketing. She didn't go out there and start a blog. She didn't start a podcast. She didn't start a YouTube channel. She didn't produce any content of any kind. All she did was try and go get freelance clients. I should go start off with freelancing. Okay, cool. Now she has an audience of several thousand people that buy her courses in digital products. It's less than two years later. The point is she started with a service. Now you don't have to freelance per se. You can do this with a product too. But she got on the phone with people. She emailed people to build up a portfolio to make them enough money to be able to do this longer, right? It's the opposite approach. She didn't start with the audience. The audience came naturally. Now that she knows what the hell she's talking about. And so for anybody listening to this, I would say this, starting a blog, starting a podcast, getting on TikTok. If you're not already on TikTok, starting up that Twitter account, I'm not even on Twitter, doing all these things to build an audience, quote unquote, not to be all in the advice. You don't need an audience to make money. You don't need an audience to make a full-time gig at all. If you focus on building an audience first, then you're doing a lot of work for no money. And by the time you get an audience, what you want to sell might not be what your audience needs or wants to pay for. This one really hit home hard for me because I made this mistake very early on in my coaching business. Before I realized that I wanted to offer financial coaching, I built an audience of a few thousand email subscribers with blog posts about frugal living and saving money. And I gave out a lot of free printables. Then once I had an audience, I decided I wanted to sell financial coaching. I wanted to be a financial coach, but the people on my email list weren't there for financial coaching. They were there for the free printouts and the money saving articles. And not many of them, very few of them were willing to pay a thousand dollars or more for coaching. If you figure out your product or service first, then you can create content related to your offer for people who might be or who are already interested in what you're selling. So if I had done that with my financial coaching, I could have, you know, been asking myself questions about like, if somebody's on the fence with financial coaching, then how do I educate them? Or if somebody doesn't know that financial coaching is an option, how do I educate them about financial coaching and help them understand that this is a good choice for them? But I didn't do that. I gave away a lot of free stuff and collected a bunch of emails of people who just wanted more free stuff and more articles about how to cut back and save money, not how to spend money on financial coaching. And your offer might change over time, right? In fact, it probably will change and that's okay. If and when it does, you can adjust your content and your marketing as needed. But the point is don't waste your time building an audience if you don't have anything to sell because it puts you in a position of catering to your audience and what they want to buy, which isn't always a bad thing, right? As a business owner, you're filling a need for somebody, but it puts you in the position of doing that first instead of selling what you enjoy, what you're good at, and what you actually want to sell. Now, I will say this is one school of thought, and there are people out there who believe the opposite, that you should create content and build an audience before you sell anything. Ultimately, I think it depends on your goals and how settled you are in your niche or topic. If you're not sure what topics you even enjoy creating content on or what you could help people with, and your goal isn't necessarily to make money or your goal isn't to make money quickly, then sure, explore. 
Create content until you find the topic or the topics that you want to stick with. Just remember that an audience alone isn't enough to make money in business. And just because you build an audience doesn't mean that they're going to want to buy whatever you decide to sell later. So you have to have something to sell or you have to at least have an idea of what you want to sell before you start bringing people in the door. All right, those are my key takeaways. Notes, links to all the resources that are mentioned in this episode are included in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to follow in whatever app you're using to listen to the show. And if you really enjoyed it, go ahead and leave us a review. Let us know how we're doing. Um, Again, thanks for being here and for being part of the Dollar Sprout community. And I will see you in the next episode.